undefeated through the month of September, undefeated through the month of October, and always undefeated on the Sunday Smash. He's Irish O'Fell. My name is Tom Lang. Let's smash it up on a Sunday night presented by our friend, State Farm Agent Russ Forhis. Ira is the managing editor of Warchant.com and somebody who just got off the roadways today. He split up the trip over the course of two days. What was it, Ira, you just said before we came on the air? Five hours back home to Tallahassee? Yeah, you know, I got on the road last night. I drove to basically to Atlanta. Um, I, you know, I got out of the press box probably about 5.30 or 6 and thought about driving the whole way back. It's about eight and a half hours, um, but decided not to. So I stopped outside of Atlanta and then uh, drove the rest of the way today. But I I stopped for to work a little bit on the way too. So it just kind of drags it out. But, uh, but a good trip, man. And, and uh, another reminder of how – deep uh seminal nation roles i stopped at uh at, at the uh hotel in atlanta and just ran into a florida state fan who enjoys all of our content but ha- was not at the game wasn't you know just happened to see me in the in the hotel lobby so uh florida state fans are everywhere and everybody's funny he he, pull, he opened up his bag to pull out his florida state shirt to show me what he was wearing yesterday so uh, no nation is representing, which we saw at the game too uh, on saturday that's actually where i wanted to start so what a perfect segue that is uh florida state to me, Ira, that was a game we could just smile about. I understand that the third quarter is a little bit bumpy, but I don't look at it the same way I looked at Boston College on the road earlier this season. I thought Florida State was in command. 34-7 to at the break is nothing to sneeze at, especially a 24 to nothing run to close out the first half. So there's a lot of smiles there. But from the moment you joined us in the pregame show yesterday here on War Chant TV, you could see so much garnet in the background and Snuggy Hill or, or surrounding it. A lot of the bleachers were empty, but I suspect those were Wake Forest seats. That were empty. And then once you get to the game itself, for those of us that watch it on television, you could hear loud and clear the fans the whole way. What a spectacular showing of support on the road for Florida State fans yesterday. You took it in, set the stage for what you took in from your perspective. Yeah. Did they show the stands much at all? Like on TV, did you ever get to see a good view of it, uh, like a broad view? I'm sure uh, some people tweeted some pictures too, but. No, there were a couple of, of wide shots, but most of them were like those close-ups where you see a bunch of wake people congested, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah, so um, the way it was was basically their stands, that side of the stadium uh, opposite the press box. Um, if you if you, if you you envision like maybe like um, 10 little sections, right, going up and down, the, the, fir- the three on the far side were for the students, and they took up about two and a half of those sections, and then the other seven section was all Florida State fans. Like the, I guess the adult Wake Forest fans were on our side, the press box side. Um, but the other side, man, it was all Florida State, basically those six or seven sections. And then by halftime, the students had all left. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty funny. I listened to Dave Clawson's press conference. He uh, he thanked the fans who came, the students who came, especially the ones who stayed. Well, <laughs> dude, there was like seven of them. They were all out by halftime. And uh, yeah, man, the Florida State section was awesome. I think it... There's always a decent number of Florida State fans really at any of the Carolina games because there are so many alumni in the Carolinas uh, or in the area. You know, a lot of them are in the Carolinas. A lot of them maybe come up from Atlanta or come over from Virginia or whatever. But because this year that's the only game they're playing in the Carolinas and because, you know, they're not playing a game in Virginia, like I just think a lot of people we talk to are fans who came over from West Virginia or Virginia or D.C. because that was, you know, the closest Florida State was going to be this season. Did it feel extra nostalgic? Obviously, the video from the rap is outstanding. You know, Corey is frolicking down the hill doing an airplane. Who did who did the remix? Yeah, that was me. That was incredible. I don't even know what that song is. Oh, I don't my. know. Is, is that a meme? I don't know. Yeah. But it was it's phenomenal. Like, it was the first suggested song because Instagram is like tamped down on on the uh, the, the rights of some of the songs okay. you can use. I was gonna do Chariots of Fire, but it wouldn't let me sync it up with it. So I just went ahead and I. I played the first song and it was so absurd and perfectly it's perfect. Matched. It's yeah. perfect. So can we, uh, can we run it on here at some point? Uh, I'll bet we can. If uh, I dir- think it's, I direct it was- Ben, go ahead. Like it, it's on our Twitter feed. I put it on our Twitter feed last night, so it'll be easier. Cause it was a 24 hour story. And the uh, glitter, the glitter effects. It's unbelievable. It's you know, <laughs> <laughs> I read that, you know, it was a, 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 watching it. a celebratory Saturday night in the house last night. I just, I enjoy, I enjoyed the hell out of it. And so, you're getting a little froggy. You're watching the afternoon and the evening window. I'm like, let's make something fun. And uh, so uh, Director Ben will pull it up. Uh, but that's an all-time wrap. Did you feel any um, I don't, any longing for the past, Ira, nostalgia? Because 
you never know. Uh, with the 277 model they got coming out on uh, tomorrow yeah. night on ACC Network, when the next time Florida State will be at Snuggy Hill, if, if, if ever again. So did you feel that at all? I'll tell you what, man. Everywhere I've gone this season, like from going to ACC kickoff in the summer till now, like everywhere we go, oh, here we go. Here's the uh, – Here's Corey frolicking in the uh, be golden rose rose. I wanna be golden rose rose. I- For people that haven't seen the rap yet, what's wrong with you? Go watch it. But yeah, we yeah. started off with me talking and acting like I don't know where Corey is, and he's he's doing the airplane running down Snuggy Hill, uh, coming in hot. So uh, anyway, it was the remix, though, is, is fantastic. Um, but yeah, no, I've been really honestly this whole season, I, everywhere we go, I'm kind of like, I wonder if we're ever coming back here again. Yeah. So I'm, I would not bet all my money on the fact that we're going to go back to Snuggy Hill again. Um, and if that was the last time, good way to end it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see. Maybe they'll go back in two years. But, uh, but if they don't, that was a kind of good way to go out because everything about it kind of felt like, the headline on my story uh, yesterday was order restored. And uh, I had a text from somebody at FSU uh, relatively high up um, who texted me. He's like, that was, that's a perfect headline. Uh, order was restored. That's why they pay you the big bucks. R. Wilmer <laughs> says uh, two, seven, seven, what? Okay. So because R. Wilmer, uh, the ACC is expanding next year, as you know, uh, bravely and boldly into the Western part of the country. Yeah. Uh, now there are going to be 17 teams in the conference, which means you'll have two locked in opponents year for year. And then they're doing like they used to do for the one year, I guess the three, five, five, it's a two, seven, seven rotation. So who the hell knows? I hope that we never have to uh, worry about that one bit. What, what is, what has you laughing? Or what did I miss? No, no, just yeah, some of the comments Ben's running through there, but no, I, yeah, I think the, yeah, I'm fascinated by this whole thing, but I can't get invested in like the yeah. future of the ACC because I'm, I'm assuming, I'm working under the assumption that it's not going to be our problem. I mean, it will be for the next year or two. We'll see how it all works out. But, but um, you know, it's going to be a brave new world for the ACC, and uh, hopefully we're not here to see it. Not a, not a ringing endorsement from Jim Phillips at uh, the basketball tip-off event when he says, I don't control what goes on in campuses in terms of the decisions that they're going to make. Yeah. But what we've done is, is secure the ACC's future for now and into the future. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, we're, they're about to ride. And uh, that's the commissioner saying that. So that that to me was kind of a headline in and of itself. But let's get back to the game, Ira. This was something uh, for me personally, again, it checked all the boxes. You came out, you were dominant. You fought through some questionable officiating, especially towards the end of the first half. And in that third quarter, you pushed past it. Uh, the offense had variety. If you wanted to see more underneath stuff, you got it. If you wanted to see Trey Benson have a couple of moments where he looks more decisive, you got that as well. 150 uh, scrimmage yards. Uh, for Trey Benson yesterday. Special teams was good in the return game, especially Deuce Span had a big moment. Jordan Travis was outstanding. I mean, Ira, for, at least from afar on the television, uh, this was as satisfying a first 30 minutes as you could get. And, I, and again, I, I don't feel like it was in touch the same way that the Boston College game was earlier this season at all. I think this was about as complete eff- an effort as you could see from Florida State. I was very pleased. How, how about you? What did you see? Yeah, and even when you know the offense sputtered a little bit early, uh, they had a couple drives where they they weren't really clicking, um, and it got to ten seven in the second quarter. I wasn't really surprised because that's kind of that's why I picked a lower score because I just yep. for whatever reason it, I just had a feeling they might bog down a little bit in the red zone, and it was like they would they would move the ball very well, but then get down to the twenty or thirty yard line and something would go wrong, or the you know it seemed to me, and, I, and we'll hear more from Mike Norvell tomorrow. It seemed to me like in the passing game, maybe some of those young receivers who have not played a ton because you you were out of you're missing two starters at wide receiver, that maybe some other of those guys were seeing things differently than Jordan was seeing them. And uh that led to maybe some of them just the routes not being crisp compared to where Jordan was throwing the football. And so when you're watching it, a lot of times it feels like Jordan's inaccurate, but I don't know if it's that. A lot of times when the receivers were going off to the sideline, you'd see Dugans or Norvell talking to the receiver. So um you know, I just think it's uh, it wasn't crisp, but man, once it got rolling, uh, it yep. was it was good night. And so for that reason, I, I was with you. I wasn't even when they they weren't finishing drives. I felt like they were okay because they were moving the ball really well. Yep. And then uh, you know, I thought you know defensively they played really well. Um, but that run there, you know, before halftime was, I mean, 
it it's funny when they when they when they were going to score with like three minutes left or whatever. I said that Corey and I were talking about it. And we're like, man, Clawson's in a tough spot here because he's going to want to throw the ball. You're not going to want to run it three times. They were down 31 to seven, and you're not going to want to run it three times with like a minute and a half, two minutes to go before halftime. And Florida State had two timeouts. But if you throw it, yeah. that now they don't need to use a timeout on that down. And so, and that's exactly how it played out. And they end up getting another field goal out of it. And uh, it just felt like Florida State was overwhelming Wake Forest. And I know this is not a great Wake Forest team. It's not as good as the ones from the last few years, but but still a, a decent team. They're they're competently coached, and, and Florida State really just overwhelmed them uh, in that game. Yeah, you know, for me, Ira, yesterday was the closest thing to the revenge tour type of satisfaction right, right. That, that you've had this season. I've got no issue with Dave Clawson, but I might have said some hateful things before halftime as Mike was calling timeout. I said, you keep it, Mike. <laughs> You do it. You call those timeouts. And when he, you know, if he does it for the first one, he's going to do it all the way through the, the series of downs. And when he called a timeout, uh, Jamie looked at me a little cross eyed. I was like, that's what you and some other things. And uh, <laughs> of course, they didn't cap it off with a touchdown, but they scored right. points before the break. Right. Um, a good omen yesterday. I shared this in the post game show. The last time Florida State sent a kicker to Winston Salem with a perfect season, only to have that kicker miss for the first time all year. Was ten years ago, Ira. How about that? How about Roberto that? Aguayo, his only miss in the national championship season, came in a blowout ten years ago at Winston Salem. So there's just, you know, for after Boston College, we we got into the grand debate about what's real and what's not. This was even though they missed a field goal in the second half, they moved the ball well. Wake was aided by a couple of ridiculous penalties. Yes. Um, the officials off the top rope again. It's amazing, even though it's not really amazing. It should be expected. Uh, this was just uh, top to bottom, Ira, and it was it was Jordan Travis' best game, I thought too. That throw late to Kyle Morlock. To Kyle Morlock, wow! Well, one of his best ones of the season. That was just brilliant, brilliant play from Jordan yeah. yesterday. Yeah, there were a few throws that were impressive, um, but yeah, that one was, I mean, it for sure. Um, and you know, I think uh, I thought again, I liked his demeanor yesterday. I thought he was in g- complete control and really composed, even when there was a couple times where there mis- where there were miscommunications. And you could tell he was not thrilled with maybe the receivers, or the routes. You know, he he seemed much more cons- controlled than he did maybe a few weeks ago uh, when we were a little bit concerned about it. And um, yeah, I, you know, I think the the it was funny the, as far as the officiating goes. It was like in the first quarter, I didn't see any issues at all, and I was thinking, well, maybe the fact that Corey made a big deal about the fact that Wake Forest first two home games they had like 26 penalties on the opponents and four for them or whatever. That maybe there's like a hey, chill out or something. But then the second quarter, it was like, okay, we we got to do something here, and uh, and yeah, there were some some interesting calls there, and uh, I mean, I, you know, look, the offensive pass interference, I didn't get it all. I never saw a great re- Wake Forest uh, setup for the media is great in a lot of ways. The only thing it's not great with is replays. We have yeah. they have like four little, I, I they're like tw- twenty four inch TV monitors in the corners of the press box. You can't really even see them, so I couldn't really see the holding call on Roddick. Um, the replay on the screen didn't look like it was an obvious hole, but maybe it was. But the pa- offense pass interference was just crazy. Um, yep. I can't believe they called that. No, especially considering there was clutching and grabbing going on the entirety of the yeah. first quarter. It's like that's the moment that you're going to decide to assess a flag on somebody, anybody. Uh, they got away with a horse collar on Jordan Travis, the second drive mm-hmm. of the game, and that first run. That's why he gets up so pissed off right. after that first run on the second drive. Ira, it's about three or four steps that the kid is just holding on for dear life. It looks like a bad movie. Uh, of course, Florida State would get called for a couple of horse collars in the second yeah. half of the ball game. That holding call, though, there was no replay live, Iron. You'll see the replay, I'm sure, soon. But there was no replay in that broadcast that suggested that that's – I mean, it, RG3 even said, just wave your hands and maybe they'll throw a flag, and that's right. what it kind of it kind of looked like. The one great thing, though, and again, I tweeted this during the game, like it, it would reminded you of – for years, the officiating the ACC was not good, and for years it, it really was – you know, against the Florida States because it was like it was you almost felt sometimes in the 90s like they were trying to help the other team just stay in the game or or give them a reason. You know, like if you hit the quarterback too hard or if you if you slam somebody down, that kind of stuff. Well, that that didn't matter in the 90s. But in yeah. the 2000s, when Florida State's talent level started to come down, especially on offense, then it did matter. And now if you get some bad calls, it could mean the difference between winning and losing. That game felt like the '90s to me, where man, you could call whatever you want, and it's not going to matter. It's just going—it may change the final score a little bit, yeah. but it's not going to change the outcome of this game because 
Florida State has, has now built a team and they're playing at such a high level that, you know, these other teams really aren't all that competitive. I had no action on the game. Florida State was a 20 plus point favorite, 20 and a half or thereabouts, Iron. Maybe they did because they really tried to keep it around that 20 number. And I think they had they had people sweating bullets towards the end, uh, especially with the missed short field goal. You just you get a little bit worried. We've got a few people to thank here uh, as about 600 of you are locked in with us right now on Sunday Smash, powered by our friend at State Farm. That is Agent Russ Voorhis, longtime Florida State supporter, longtime Warchant.com supporter. More about Russ in a moment. Z-Chan, the official DMD of Warchant TV with the red donation. Thank you very much, Z-Chan. We appreciate you. We look good, says Z-Chan. Ira, can you pontificate about the intricacies of college football playoff rankings and the 208,974 potential combinations of factors and how they will air all factor together to tell us who will be ranked at the end of the year? Joking, of course. Love y'all. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Z-Chan. Well, Ira, it matters to yeah. us again, the college football show, finally. It, how about it, that? About nine years it does. So. I feel like I feel like man, I was on. I was like Tom Hanks in Castaway or whatever. Like or you know, I like I felt like because rem- nine years ago we would sit there and like panic about the college football playoff committee. And I know they didn't do the rankings every week back then, but they would have the conversations. I don't think they did right. They didn't do rankings every week, right? Yeah, I don't think it was this frequent. They probably did five or six of them, maybe. But, but I uh, remember that Arkansas AD at the time was the – Jeff Long, I think was his name. Yeah. He was the guy that would come up and, and just kind of justify how Florida State – yeah, they did because Florida State was fourth. Um, yeah. And they were having to justify where, why Florida State was fourth. And so then after 2014, like once 2015 comes around and the Rex – Man, I don't. I have not watched ten seconds of a college football ranking show. I don't know if you have. No. Um, so now it's like it's or it's like you know I've been released from prison or I, I, I captivity. Like I'm back now in civilization, and now I've got to watch this show again on Tuesday night, like everybody else. Oh, the, the well, actually, well, actually, energy from Jeff Long. I believe he was Arkansas's athletic director. Arkansas, yep. Yeah. And he's like, well, if you look at the game control, and you're like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. And then you realize, Ira, that they're all they're lying to you at ESPN because they said that we don't know the rankings until like the moment that the show starts. They're they're locked away. There's an envelope, right. and then there was the six o'clock Sports Center that had changed the rankings one through four ahead of the seven o'clock show. And wouldn't you know it, the <laughs> rankings they changed the teams to were correct. It's <laughs> almost as though ESPN had an advanced tip. What wouldn't you believe it? Uh, but yeah, let's set the stage there. Nine years ago, where were you? Were you at Warchant yet, or were you uh, working for the periodical? I was at Warchant. I switched switched to Warchant after the 2013 season. So yeah, go, in the f- fall fall of 2014 was my first year back at Warchant. Yeah. Wow, I was on the FM dial. I was a program director nine years ago in my right. middle 20s. This is Ira. We've waited too long. You've had to do too many Warchant raps looking yeah. beleaguered with Corey from Snuggy Hill. It, it just yeah. It's a full circle kind of year. And Tuesday night, I should mention, we don't have a fancy name for it yet. We still got to workshop that. But there is going to be a watch-along show. So you don't have to listen to the dumb people on the panel talking about how Florida State isn't this or isn't that. Join us on War Chan TV Tuesday night. The time will be released shortly. My guess is we'll jump on a little bit ahead of 7 o'clock. And then we will watch together and see where Florida State is ranked for the first week of the college football rankings. You can find that here on Warchant TV. And we'll probably do a lot of making fun of the different ESPN personalities mm. during that time. Yes. I guess. Uh, yeah. Yes. We're, we're, this is we all huddle together here on Warchant TV. So that's what's going on on Tuesday night. Ira, I'll ask a general question about that before we thank a couple other people who have contributed. Um, Setting precedent, do you think that that matters? Having not watched the college football playoff selection show in nine years, do you think Florida State's position in week one matters because of the ability to move up or down week to week? Or do you think it's just going to be a dog and pony show until we get to later in November? Oh, and yeah, and thanks again, Z-Chan. I didn't uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think I think it matters to a degree. Um, I definitely think it matters to a degree. And that's why I take all of it seriously, man. Like I take all of the little subtle politicking from different people that have platforms uh, that kind of set the stage, you know, and I know at the end of the day, what the public thinks or, or whatever, isn't going to necessarily change based on like what the public opinions is based on what talking heads at ESPN or wherever say, but I do feel like it's part of that, that once it becomes narrative and becomes fact, it's almost like you have to overcome that. And that's not fair. 
Um, so I just feel like, um, yeah, I mean, I think you, you need to be in there. Um, and I think you can make a case, man. I talked to, you know, I've talked to a lot of different people that are not even Florida state fans who, if you look at it objectively, Florida state, I mean, his res Florida state's resume is as impressive as anybody else's, maybe better than anybody else's. And it, you know, if it wasn't, the only reason you're, you're going to put Georgia and Michigan and I guess Ohio state above them is because of what's happened in recent years. You know, the fact that they, you know, a lot of those were in the playoffs. They've been in the playoffs. Georgia's won two straight national championships. But if you look at the way the teams have played this year, you, it's hard to argue that those teams are, are clearly better than Florida State, let alone Florida State somehow being left out of the top four, which is what has been put forth by, um, you know, some of the talking heads. Yeah, the, the dominance factor is what Florida State will be battling when it comes to Michigan. And, then, and it's a good final impression for Georgia yesterday to blow the doors off of Florida, who was 5-2 right. and two at the time. Whatever we believe of them is, is irrelevant. Just, you know, if you're going to argue for Georgia, they gave you more ammunition. But there's two things that Florida State has, Ira. It's, it's uh, the strength of record, you know, the, the strength of the schedule that they played so far. And then if you look at efficiency metrics, which they are supposed to be considering the committee, Florida State is number, I think, top 11 in both offensive and defensive efficiency. They're about the most balanced team in the country. So if Florida State is going to be ranked highly in the eyes of the committee, I think that's what they're going to lean on. You just have to hope that that's where they go and Florida State isn't behind, uh, you know, a, a team like Washington. Like that, that would be something from the top row because Washington struggled again this weekend. Uh, this is two in a row now. They didn't score an offensive touchdown, not one, against Arizona State two weeks ago. And if Stanford's all world wide receiver doesn't go down, I don't know. That might have been a game all the way right. to the bitter end. So I think Florida State is, is should be comfortably above Washington. And then the Big 12's out of the race for now, Ira, until the field comes back to them. Oklahoma losing to Kansas yesterday is a huge deal for Florida State because now at maximum four conferences in the Power Five can have an undefeated conference champion. That discussion is completely dead now. Yeah, yeah. And the only, you know, I think the one unfortunate thing, I guess, for Florida State is I whoever they play in the ACC championship game probably is not going to help their cause a whole lot. I mean, we'll see. Um, maybe Louisville wins out. I just, I don't know that they will. Um, I have a feeling you're going to be playing a two loss team um, in the, in the AC championship game. So you're not going to get a whole lot of uh, style points for that. I originally thought maybe if you end up playing Clemson again, or if you somehow end up playing like a top 10 North Carolina team. Um, but I think Florida state's resume is going to be what it is probably after that Florida game. And I don't think they're going to be picking up points by the because all these other conference championship games, I think probably are going to look better, or, or some of them will look better than Florida State's. Probably so. Where Louisville stands in the college football playoff top twenty-five Tuesday is important. Yeah. Um, you know, if they're going to win out. But then again, who knows? They're playing Virginia yeah. Tech this upcoming weekend, and Ira Virginia Tech only has one conference loss, yeah. so the Hokies are still alive. If they were to score an upset this weekend, they would be in the driver's seat to, uh, to beat uh, yeah. to match Florida State. It's a rematch from twenty ten. Of uh, the ACC championship game. So wouldn't that yeah, be yeah. so on brand? No more coastal, but they're doing the coastal thing left and right in this conference. And it would be, yeah, that was the, uh, that was what the matchup was supposed to be when they went to the divisions. It was supposed to be Florida state and Virginia tech, or Florida state and Miami in the conference championship all the time. And it was for a little while there, you're getting Florida state and Virginia tech. Um, but uh, it's been a long time since Virginia tech has been relevant. I think, you know, it's funny though, them and Boston college, both, I, I think we felt like, there was a chance the way they played in those games against Florida State that both those teams may have found something offensively with those new quarterbacks, and I think that's proven to be the case. And I think that makes you know again we're none of this is relevant on a national scale. No matter how good BC looks on offense since what they looked like earlier in the year or Virginia Tech, none of these teams are going to give you any kind of clout, and and so that's the challenge for Florida State. I mean, they have to be undefeated. And uh, they have to hope that there's no chicanery going on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I consider me a cynic in that regard. Yeah. Uh, to, to the nearly 700 of you that are watching, thank you for being here on Sunday Smash on War Chant TV. He's Ira. I'm Tom. Please hit the thumbs up underneath the video. Helps us find more FSU fans, and there's going to be more of them flocking the casuals. You're the diehards, but the casuals are about to be flocking to where they can get Florida State news. So if you hit the thumbs up, we can find more of them. We appreciate your support as we do the support of Robert D. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, he just had kind words for us. I think there was an autocorrect there where he says golf war chant. I do like to golf, Robert, but go Knowles, go war chant. Thanks for all you do. We appreciate you. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Robert. Uh, and then Joshua. Now, this is a question from yesterday. Was that the most nonchalant one-handed catch you've ever seen? Also, 
Did it look like Keon was waiting for that safety to punk him with the stiff arm? I mean, I'm so, thank you, uh, Joshua. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I, I don't know why I didn't tweet. I think I got distracted with something I was doing, but I almost tweeted about uh, Keon's stiff arm because I do think he waited for him. And it was also the mis- dis- most dismissive face uh, stiff arm I think I've ever seen. It was, it was like Keon called. I've got more fear of, I don't know, you know, uh, 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 aliens coming into my house right now than Keon Coleman did that that guy was going to stop him from getting in the end zone. I mean, like it, it was, I mean, it was just comical. I mean, that guy is, he is literally a man among boys. The one handed catch was uh, incredible too. It's just great to see again. I said it before, but the variety, you know, like this touchdown for Keon on the quick short hitch and the, the run, the stiff arm, all that kind of stuff. Ira, that was something we saw last year at Syracuse. Malik McLean put somebody into the ground last right, year right, at Syracuse right. in an evil way. Johnny Wilson scored a touchdown, same thing. But it's just when you're watching the offense here, and thank you, Robert, we'll get to your second, uh, uh, oh, this is different, Robert, uh, donation in just a moment. But Ira, this offense feels like it's coming together a little bit. That's not a slouch of a defense yeah. from Wake Forest. That Mustafa kid at safety can really play. Yeah. And there was a deep shot to Darion Williamson where it's almost like, yeah. I remember Jordan's throw against Notre Dame a few years ago, that Monday night, and that, that safety for Notre Dame ran clear across the field, yeah. and he broke it up. Uh, they well, got, the kid from Notre Dame picked off that one pass. Oh, he picked it off, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah that, was, that kid was unbelievable. I mean, it was a play that was akin to that. So my point, again, is this is not a slouch of a defense. They weren't ranked uh, you know, in the hundreds in defense. Their offense was terrible coming yeah. into the game, but not Wake Forest defense. And it just looks like the uh, Florida State offense, Ira, is coming together. Different pieces, different facets of it. Maybe it's forced because of the injuries, but it looks like it's in a much healthier place than it was even, say, eight days ago, nine days ago. Yeah, I'd recommend people, if you get a chance, go go look for Dave Clawson's post-game press conference uh, from yesterday. And he, he was really complimentary of Florida State during the week. And all these coaches have been. And I know sometimes you kind of roll your eyes about, you know, I don't know, how do they really feel? I can just tell you, we've been covering Dave Clawson for about 10 years, and he's not a guy who just throws out, you know, just false compliments just because. He is – he could be a little bit uh, salty. We saw it during the game, the way he was interacting with the officiating. That's how he is. He gives no quarter and, and takes no quarter. And the way he talked about Florida State after the game is really incredible. I mean, he he basically, especially talking about the offense, he's like, it's an all-star team. He's like, they didn't even have 14. And he's one of the best receivers in the conference. He goes, you know, it's just ridiculous. He goes, you you bring the tight ends they've got, the receivers they've got, the, the you know, Jordan Travis, he, you know, he was – uh, stomping for, for stumping for Jordan Travis to to win the Heisman or at least be in New York, um, and I again I think we I'm not saying we take it for granted, but we've kind of come to expect it, and our expectations were so high coming into this year that when they only scored 38 points or whatever, it felt like maybe they're not playing to their level. But I think now you've seen it over eight games. I think you do have to appreciate that you know this this offense, man. It's 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 a bear. Ira, you get to talk to Jordan Travis as much as anybody in the media. You're there for all of all of his interviews. Uh, what do you make of you know the the point after last week? He in the post game he talked about post Syracuse game. He and Mike Norvell sat down on a Sunday and they talked about having more fun. Uh, he wasn't exactly thrilled in the first half of the Duke game last week. It wasn't like the the light bulb clicked on. But by the end of the game, I think you saw what he was driving home at and what he's trying to do. Do you think that there is a line of delineation for Jordan Travis before the conversation and after, or is it just, you know, maybe it's coincidence that Florida State looks to be putting it together after uh, coach and quarterback had that talk? I do. I definitely think it was a big moment. And, and this, you know, and, and Mike Norvell kind of downplayed a little bit because, I mean, they these conversations are happening all the time. Like a, a good head coach is observing body language, is observing actions, is observing comments all the time. I remember back in the day when I was at the Osceola, Coach Bowden would read the Osceola because he liked reading the quotes um, and he'd read the Democrat too, but he, he liked reading the players quotes to kind of have a feel for what the players are thinking. What are they saying when I'm not there or when my coaches aren't there? And so I think Mike Norvell is paying attention like any good coach to all these things. And I think, you know, we were talking about it in those couple of games. It wasn't like Jordan was being a jerk to anybody, but it just felt like he was so wound so tight, like, he wants this offense to be great because it should be great. And when it's not, you could see he was kind of getting frustrated. And then when Norvell talked to him, I definitely think there's been a difference. Um, I think it's been a market difference and I don't think it was like, Hey, you're going to mess this up. But I think it was like, Hey, relax, you know, just play and have fun. 
it's going to take care of itself. Like we're, we've got these weapons. You keep working and getting better, but, but stressing about every incompletion or every play that doesn't go perfectly isn't really going to help things. And I think it's, I think it's something we've seen, you know, and then, you know, you start getting Jordan more involved in the running game and things like that, that brings out some energy too. I just think they're in such a better place right now than they were two or three weeks ago. It feels like that to me anyway. Yeah, well, I'm glad that that's in in your mind legitimate. Like you can feel that in the room when you're talking to him because I think that's the new, that's the 2023 version of um, who's Nick O'Leary's famous grandfather. Because I think you're going to hear about it on every TV. Oh, are they? They're talking about on the TV. Chris Budden was the silent reporter. She brought it up, and I think that's going to be something that people are going to return to, especially Ira, if Jordan's Heisman candidacy continues to climb. I think he's back on the radar now. There's been so much disappointment across the country. Marvin Harrison Jr. to me is he's going to be there in New York at minimum. But if not for sack adjusted yardage or, or non adjusted rushing yardage with sacks, it's 400 yards on the nose yesterday, Ira, and four touchdowns for Jordan Travis. There are times when he has a humongous impact on the game, but it doesn't show it on the stat sheet. Yesterday, it matched up. He was the most important player on offense, and the stats said so in a way that's going to grab the casual media member or voter's attention, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I also think now that Florida State's showing this staying power, uh, at least to this point and being eight, no, uh, you know, a lot of teams are falling by the wayside. Like you talked about Oklahoma or some of these other teams that are, and I think there's a chance, you know, well, I know we know Ohio state, Michigan are going to play each other. Um, so the longer Florida state can stay undefeated and the longer Florida state's in that conversation, the more eyeballs are going to be on them. And I think they're in, and you got two huge games coming up. I mean, the Miami game and the Florida game, what he does in those games, I think are going to, as long as Florida state keeps winning, you know, those, that, those, those are going to be two good platforms. Miami, I don't know how good they are, but, but at least the record still looks decent. And, you know, Florida, same thing, but it'll be in Gainesville. You know, there'll be a lot of eyes on it. Um, so I just, I think he's going to have an opportunity to really make his case. And I, again, I think it's a good time because I think the team's playing its best right now. There was a comment that was wiped up. Uh, it was Joshua. I'm going to pull this director. I like this comparison. The flow of the game reminded me of the 2013 NC State game. Big lead in the first half, sleepwalk in the second half. NC State was so proud to quote unquote win the second half. 42 to nothing at the break. They won 49 to 17. That game was infamous, Ira, because it was 35 to nothing at the end of the first quarter. Yeah. Which was was wild. But I like the comparison between the first half and the second half. Again, it just didn't feel like the game was in the balance. Hell, Dave Clawson told you their first drive, they go down the field and they kick a field goal for really no reason that that tells you that the head coach on the other sideline knows this ball game's over. There's no miracle comeback in the works today. And it, it did follow that script a little bit. I like that comparison from Joshua. I think that was also the game where they were playing hangman on the sideline. Mm-hmm. So, so there you go. Uh, that tells you all you need to know. Nick O'Leary should break, break out the old hangman board for the guys uh, in, in, in that situation. But um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, no, I think that's a good comparison. I also thought my, and, and again, Dave Claus in this post game press conference, kind of alluded to that he almost – it's almost sounded like he kind of told the players at halftime, mm-hmm. we're not going to win this game. Like he said, his message to the players at halftime was, don't worry about what happened. We just saw – don't worry about what just happened. Let's try to win the second half. Yep. Like that's the only thing we in, in exactly what you said, which, or exactly what uh, Joshua said. And that was Dave Clawson's message at halftime was, I don't care what's going to happen. Let's try to win the second half and let's see what can happen. Um, and they did, you know, give them credit, man. They came out and I thought they played pretty well in the second half. I thought they, they played a little bit more aggressively, a little bit more confidently. Um, I think Florida state naturally, like a lot of teams do, you kind of relax a little bit and you make some mistakes and, and they made you pay for it a little bit, but, but I agree. It never felt like it was in doubt. And it felt like whenever Florida state wanted to kind of step on their throat, they'd be able to do that. Yeah, and you know, I'm not saying that the players need to and get complacent, but I think we all need to listen to the opposing head coaches when they tell you that this is the most complete team that they've seen all year and maybe a long period of time. Uh, it's, it's too long of a discussion for that on Sunday Smash, but we need to revisit the NFL draft prospects and just the sheer number of Florida State players that could be drafted this upcoming spring. And I'm talking it doesn't have to be first day or second day. It's well over 10, and that's what you're watching. A lot of NFL dudes uh, week in and week out for Florida State. Robert Benton, thank you very much for your contribution to the show tonight. He says, have your expectations or the bar set for this team changed between week one and now? If so, how much has it changed and why? What say you, Ira? I think they have to a degree. Like, I, you know, what I was saying all preseason and going back to the summer was I felt like 
if this team didn't make the playoff, it was going to feel disappointing, or, or at least win the ACC yep. and probably go to the playoff. It was going to feel disappointing because this was a window. Like this was a window where you'd have a chance with a senior quarterback and all of these weapons to make a run. And Clemson probably coming back down to earth, which is we could kind of feel that coming, that you know this would be a great opportunity. But I didn't know that they were good enough to do it. You know, like that was my concern is I, I hated putting that out there because I didn't know if they were good enough to do it. I didn't know if they were good enough to win at Clemson. I didn't know if they were good enough to to kind of be consistent week after week after week to where we are today. Yeah, man, I think they're they're one of the four best teams in the country. I think they might be one of the two best teams in the country. I want to see them play those teams. Like yeah. back in the summer, I thought maybe, well, and maybe they'll get a good matchup in the playoff. You know, they'll get, maybe they'll find a way to the championship game. And then who knows what happens? I don't know that there's any game going into it where I'm going to be like, oh man, Florida State's going to have a real hard time winning this game. I mean, there'll be great games, but there's nobody I don't think Florida State can beat right now. And I did not think that four yeah. months ago. For me, I, I was a playoffs or bust guy. Right. Um, after seeing what they did in the portal and the retention, you know, you're getting all these key pieces back. And and to me, it was is because you're reading the tea leaves elsewhere, Ira, just like you're talking about. We could sense something was up at Clemson and there might be a bit of a shift there or some unease on the surface. But then when you just have so many programs like Ohio State and Georgia and Alabama trying to break in new quarterbacks. Right. You know, it's like if you're gonna be veteran laden, this is a great year. The timing of the rise, you know, mirrors very neatly with uh, the oligarchy of college football being down just a little bit, just a little bit. So I thought this was a great time to be playoffs or bust. And then I would say, Robert, uh, as we got into the season, I thought, all right, they're a playoff team, but I don't know that they can win the national title for a couple of weeks there when when you saw some of the inconsistencies. This team can win it all, Ira. I don't mm-hmm. think there's any yeah. doubt that this team is good enough to win it all. Full stop, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, you know, you look, Georgia was impressive against Florida, but we really don't know if that Florida team's any good. Like everything Florida has done that's made you wonder, okay, maybe they're pretty good. You can look back at it and say, oh, I don't know. Like, like they beat South Carolina. Well, South Carolina stinks. South Carolina's two and six, I believe. Their wins are against Furman and Mississippi State, who also stinks. So it's not like that's a, a, a big accomplishment. I mean, their, their win over Tennessee is, I guess, the best thing that they've got going for them. But I mean, it's not like we don't know how good Florida is. So Georgia dismissed of them pretty easily. But college football that we we all know this we watch football who you play and who's on the other side of the field completely ch- changes how you look mm-hmm. and, and you could look dominant against an inferior uh, opponent but when you get on the field with other great players it's gonna be different and i was just i was having the conversation while i was driving back uh today i was talking to jim lamar uh who used to be in the business and and, and he was talking about georgia looking good defensively Mm-hmm. And he was saying, you know, they're not as good as they have been, but they're still really good. And I was like, yeah, man, Keon Coleman's a pro, you know? Yeah. I mean, like Jordan Travis is a, is a, I, th- I think he's a great college quarterback. Jaheim Bell's a pro. I mean, so it's not like any of those guys are going to be shut down. I don't think by anybody that Georgia has. So it would just be fun to watch. Yeah, and it's not like their offense would light the world on fire. Exactly, on the other side of the ball, yeah. It's a fair fight. There there have been many years where a Florida State team, even like this one, maybe two years ago, I don't know that it's a fair fight. You might need a couple of bounces to go your way in order to beat a veteran late in Georgia that's got the depth of you know, several top three classes in a row. They'd have a chance, but you wouldn't pick them necessarily. This year, you could pick them. I'd pick them against any. they got a great chance to beat anybody. And NFL, at Knowles, Knowles fan, NLZ fan, he always does this at the beginning of all of our live shows, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, fifteen and zero, he says it every really? single show. So the the dream is, uh, if you're going to get there, Ira, you're more than halfway there at eight and zero. We're beginning November. Florida State is undefeated. Tommy Jenkins, thank you very much. He's calling for the Julio. He is calling for the Don <laughs> Julio. Is Tommy Jenkins? He's even chanting for it. Will Ira oblige? I wonder. <laughs> It's uh, it's up in the uh, it's up in the cabinet. We'll see. We'll see how we'll see how it goes. Before we uh, you know figure out whether or not the Julio will make an appearance, who will make an appearance pretty soon is Dominic Robinson, our lead football analyst here at Warchant.com. He'll be joining us in a few moments. Before he does, let's make sure we give some love to the man, the myth, the agent known as Russ Voorhis of State Farm. Uh, Russ has a couple of shops, brick and mortar stores, as you can see at the bottom of the screen in Jacksonville Beach and Orange Park on the east part of the state. But Ira. He's regional, baby. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the state of Georgia, if you're living in the state of Alabama, of course, state of Florida, top to bottom. He can help you with all your insurance needs. 
And as Ira has said before, he's also willing to meet you and talk with you one-on-one. Even if you might not go his direction, he is a fountain of knowledge and he's willing to do that for you because you're a fellow Noel out there. So uh, Ira, you've had an experience or two in that regard. Yeah, I did. I, mean, I went through a, a situation with trying to figure out some insurance plans, and and Russ was great to me, and uh, and he'd be great to you. I have no, con- I have every confidence in that. And uh, and like you said, it's a he's a he's a he's a guy who's supported Florida State for through thick and thin. He's got, I think, he's endowed a scholarship. He's been a very active booster uh, for years and years and years, and and he's uh, supports War Chant and just a really good all around guy. And I, I think from when you talk about the ease of. Uh, the process. If you go to his website, you can request information. They'll reach out to you. You can talk to them and and uh, they'll walk you through the process. And I, I encourage anybody, if you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with your insurance purposes, uh, give Russ a shout. Let's drive that point home with 15 seconds of more. RussForHis.com. Contact Russ Boris for an auto quote today. The folks call him Five Star Irish Chauffeur, so I'll ask Five Star Chauffeur, how would you rate your experience in Ireland this summer? One to five stars. What would you give it? Oh, it was a five star. It was awesome. You too can experience this. That's the segue. There's a contest going on right now. Seminoles to Ireland.com slash win. Seminoles to Ireland.com slash win. This is for your chance to win a trip for two to Ireland next year for Florida State's game against Georgia Tech. What would you win, you ask? Well, of course, you get two tickets to the game, but how about two round-trip tickets from Aer Lingus to get you from the United States to Dublin, Ireland? You also will have three nights of hotel accommodations in Dublin at your leisure. You can arrive, enjoy the scene, get the jet lag out of the way, enjoy the beautiful, beautiful countryside or the city of Dublin in Ireland, whichever you wish to do. There will also be pregame hospitality for you before the kickoff on August the 24th. So it's free to try, and you could be joining us at War Chant next year in Ireland. Just head to that website, seminoles to Ireland.com slash win. Good luck to you all. That contest ends Halloween night at midnight. Halloween night at midnight, so act now. Yeah, and for uh, for people that are listening to the podcast version of the show, uh, it's Seminoles number two win. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead, of, it's not to. It's number two win dot com. That is a good point. The Seminoles, uh, Seminoles number two, Ireland dot com slash win. Jeffrey Johnson, thank you very much, uh, yes, Director thanks. Ben. If he's if he's got a question, that is one heck of a contribution. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. We will get to that. And then Nolbuck eighty three, no real comment. Just wanted to give some love to the Smash. Okay, thank you, Nolbuck. Uh, thanks for the great content, Ira and Tom. That's another autocorrect. I'm a good parser of the autocorrect. <laughs> thanks, Ira Nolbuck. And- yeah, thank you, Noah Buck. We now go to our lead football analyst who is joining us from the uh, western half of the United States. It's Dominic Robinson. Dominic Robinson joins the program. He also is featured every week now on War Chant TV. We've broken down the running game. Well, by we, I mean he has broken down the running game, Jordan Travis and Florida State's defense. He'll be breaking down an 8-0 and football team this week on our channel. Good evening, Dominic. How are you? Wonderful, guys. Um, always great to see you guys smiling faces. Uh, I was <laughs> listening to you earlier um, and uh, excited to, to be here with this. This this uh, uh, kind of trying to uh, having to pinch myself. Um, yeah. You know, when you watch that game, it's such a great. I mean, and Ira, you kind of touched on it a little bit. There's this feeling and nostalgia of what it used to be. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that was wa- watching that game was a great nostalgic reminder of the times when there just was you you talked about the refs. There was a time yeah. where we would just find things to complain about just because we knew <laughs> we were gonna win. <laughs> like we just knew we were gonna win. It was yeah. we, we you know, and it was just like hey, okay, what what can we what can we complain about because you know winning or losing the game or the offensive play calling um or the defensive scheme or whatever we didn't ever have to worry about those things those were check 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 do we have the players check yep. it's it's peter bolware and and andre wadsworth check <laughs> you know we've got the players there's they're freaks out there 
Um, do we have the coaches? Yes, it's Coach Bowden. He's one of the greatest of all time. Mark Rick, one of the greatest of all time. You know, it was, it was just check, check, check. And um, that it felt that way um, right. yesterday. I, I got that that feeling. And, and there were moments of that last year. But right. this time it's like now it's a it's an eight. No, it, it's a it's a it's a it's a team who hasn't lost with a quarterback. You know, a year or two ago, it's like questions at quarterback and this that, you know, yeah. there was still was some uncertainty. It's just like this is as stable as this thing has been in 25 years or something. So that's a that's a cool feeling to have as a, as a Noel fan. So enjoying the ride, man. <laughs> and, and 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 I want to make sure everyone knows and understands. And I said this, I actually said this to our, our high school team um this week. And I said I said it to my, my son, you know, uh, talking to him about his season from this point on through January, there's a whole nother season that this is actually how we're gonna remember this year's team. Right. Yeah. So although all these great things have happened, some crazy things happen between now and January that we will remember those. We'll look back and it will actually encapsulate what this season is. Yeah. It won't be these first, you know, it's not September, October. It's really like November through December is like how you go back and it's yeah. it's the member berries from this season actually happened from now to, 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 to December or through December. It's not, you're not going to really remember, you know, yeah. weeks one through eight to be, to be honest, that's kind of the, the harsh reality of, 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 of football, of the football season. It's so long. And um, so, yeah, I think, so it's, I think it's, it's, it's important to just, um, as great as it is, and you you got to have one through eight in order for you know nine through thirteen or twelve or fourteen or whatever to be great. You got to have those, you know, and you got to stay find a way to to stay um, without getting that that L in the in the in the loss column. But from here on out, like it's a whole new season. It's a whole different thing, and you don't want to look past anybody or any small detail. They all mean something. Everything is. Everything is important, you know, from, from here on out. Tom, if I could jump in real quick, uh, and I know we'll talk a little bit more big picture stuff, but but uh, it's a great point, D-Rob, and especially I think it's even magnified this year because you get Florida and Miami both in November. You, you don't always get them both in November, but it's going to be magnified. But, man, I, I haven't talked to you about this all season, yeah. and you haven't done a video breakdown on it yet, so maybe it'll be coming. But talk to me a little bit about Keon Coleman because last year you told us all that how great Johnny was going to be, mm-hmm. and he turned out to mm-hmm. be jo- Johnny is great. We haven't seen him all the time this year because he's had to deal with a couple of things. I still, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm in the front of the, the the bus, the fan club. But what is it about Keon that makes him so special? Because I haven't, I haven't talked to you about this. You know, I um, I thoroughly enjoy watching him play because his game, his bag is um it's full it's he's he's incredibly versatile he he really there is no you know usually a guy has one plus plus tool it's you know with johnny it's sort of um uh, with johnny it's his his size catch radius his catch radius is crazy and he is he, he you know but but there's some other things that are you know uh you know you know maybe just plus, you know, it's not that they're bad. They're just, they're just good. Um, with, uh, you know, with Keon, he's, he's checks every box. He's physical. He's got elusiveness. He's good run after the catch. He's got great size. He plays the game hard. Cause that's the thing too. Usually with wideouts is there's like an attitude element, a personality element. Um, you know, they're usually pretty selfish, don't love the teammates or whatever. They don't play that way. He's just, it, it's, it's a joy to watch him because you just, you don't know. And I know, and I would say even as a, as a uh, defensive, from a defensive standpoint, defensive um, perspective, when I look at him, I, I don't, I don't believe that defenses have an answer for him because of his versatility. There's not something 
you know, usually when I watch guys, I go, oh, well, when they play this person, they'll have the other person will have an advantage because they have this over him. Right. They have length over him. They have speed over him. They have us or they have some sort of they have some sort of schematic. Hey, this guy's not going to be good versus a cover two. This guy's not going to be good um, when they roll a safety over top or something like that. With him, I just I just don't see it. And I also see Coach Norvell using him in a way that makes it very difficult to to do that, to take those things away. We were texting earlier today, uh, Dominic, before the show, and uh, you were talking about how big picture yesterday's game is an example of Florida State as a team and a program being different and turning the corner. You know, yeah. To me, it felt like one of the more complete efforts of the season – and you could feel it, you know, where even if Wake puts together a little something in the third quarter, it's they're not going to challenge you. You're not in any danger. Uh, but what do you mean by turning the corner as a program and, and a team and what you saw? Um, so there's a couple different facets of that. One is um, the ability to go on the road in what to, could, you know, kind of be – um explained as like a trap game you know you've got miami like you said you've got miami and florida on the horizon you're seven and oh um you but it's a team that's actually owned you over the last couple weeks or years um and so you know we've seen this equation play out here it's since coach norvell's been there and this is the first time that we've had a complete result from beginning to end with plus quarterback play with everyone healthy. And then with contribute contributions coming from guys that are not necessarily um, contributions that you came into the game expecting, um, you know, and, 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 and with, you know, certain guys being out Johnny being out. So it's like your stars played like stars and then your support players played like stars. And that, to me, if you were to ask me, like, hey, D-Rob, you grew up in Southern California. Like, how did you become such a huge Florida State fan? I think that's probably, I, and I tell people all the time, I just knew it. When I was a kid, I knew it. Because when I turned on those games, that's what you saw. It was just like, you're watching all of the stars. If a guy had one catch in a game, you knew, oh, I'm that's tomorrow's star. <laughs> like that, that he's not, he may not, he may that may be his only catch of the season, but that's next year's star, or that's two years from, and that's what yesterday felt like. It was just like it wasn't just okay, if the stars play like stars, we can win. We've been able to do that now over the last two years. It's like, hey, as long as Jordan plays well, um, you know, then then we we have a chance in every game. But this was the type of game where it was like, hey, we didn't just have the stars playing like stars. You know, we had support players stepping up and playing like stars. And that's that's when you kind of start to know with all of those, um, you know, facets in play in terms of the scenario with going to Wake on the road, big win. You just had a big primetime win against Duke, you know, all of these other things, sort of that trap game feel. And then you have the production that you get in a game like that. We've seen, we've seen wins um, in that situation. We haven't seen complete domination. That was offense, defense, special teams. That was scheme. That was coaching. That was hard. I mean, they played hard. Penalties were down. I mean, the list just goes on and on. It just was clean. It was a clean, um, you know, football game. Uh, you know, in, in every aspect. And you just got the feel that like, I'm, I'm watching a special, um, I'm watching a special team, a special program, a group of, of guys that's sort of a wave of things that are bigger than just, oh, they've got Johnny. Oh, they've got, um, oh, they've got Jordan. Oh, they've got Trey Benson. But then they, they, they're still, you know, the other the other aspects are just average. Everything was elite um, yesterday, and that that's the only way that you get to eight. No, is thought, you know, when everything is is elite. One thing I thought was cool also was the fact that a lot of the guys that haven't even been here before, like 
Keon Coleman, you could tell that the, the players on the team had told Keon how important this game was to them. Jaheim Bell was tweeting about the game after the game. Like you could tell it was like they were settling a score against Wake Forest that wasn't even their score. It was their teammates score. You know, like right. some of these guys have only been here a year. I thought that's pretty cool, right? That these guys, it shows you how bought in they are to the whole fabric. They're not one and done mercenaries. Like, yeah, you know, it, it mattered to them, I think. Yeah. And, and I think that that is, um, that's really, there's a lot to be said about that because that's the frontier of college football and, and college athletics that we don't know anything about. Like we're experiencing stuff that, we don't know what this is going to mean, you know, and even just now with some conference, you know, realignment and shakeups over the next couple of years, um, we're really, you know, going into this wild West where we don't know, you know, again, you bring in a Keon Coleman, who's obviously a great player, but we don't know what will it mean to him when he's in the swamp. When I was at Florida state, you knew the guys that you were leaving the tunnel with, we fully understood what it was like, you know, what the swamp meant to every single one of my teammates. I never had to look to the guy at the guy to my right or my left and think, okay, I, I got to explain to him how big this game is to me, you know? And that's the, again, this is this frontier of college football that we're going into. That's really interesting. And it's, it's very unsettling for me as a coach, you know, being, being a coach, because, Again, that Wake Forest game as a longtime Florida State fan, it meant a hell of a lot to me. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, because I because I seen. I, I mean, I still can remember the Wake Forest shutout in Doak. Um, thirty, you know, nothing, yeah. thirty to nothing in Doak, and so whenever I see that black and gold, it gives me a very uneasy feeling in my stomach, and I and I mean, I mean that. So I still, I, I, so I, I want my Keon Coleman's to feel that I mm -hmm. want my, you know, I want my, my transfers to feel that, but you just don't know, um, you know, what that's going to be like. And, and that goes to then recruiting the character and you, if you recruit character guys, you're going to get, you know, and then you coach them the right way right. and you teach them those things and what these games mean to you and what they mean to the, to their teammates and, and uh, the things that have happened in the past and all of that, then maybe you can get, um, you know, you get a special, special equation. And that's, that's sort of what's, what's going on right now. But, but yeah, that's a, a an interesting thing that, um, you know, that they, uh, that they felt that and that they, that it meant something to them. Like I said, I think that that just shows the character of, of the guys that they're, they're recruiting. And I think that that, that ends up being bigger than the talent in terms of the transfer portal is who are you bringing into the fabric of your team into the fabric of your locker room is a much bigger, bigger. And, uh, and honestly, and I think every coach, if you gave them some truth serum, they'll tell you it. I don't care how good of a coach you are, a recruiter you are. You honestly don't know. Right. You yeah. never, ever know because the only way to find out is once they're actually there. And you can break it down and you can have you can sit down with his family and have all the dinners you want. And I can tell you right now, NCAA won't allow it to be enough that you would know <laughs> that yeah. you would know whether that guy's going to actually fit in terms of the chemistry. So you do have to have a little bit of luck, luck involved that the guy that you're interested in is also interested in you. He's a very good player that can play right away. And he also fits the chemistry in your locker room. The, the chemistry part is just, it's so, so important. And we all know it exists, but no, none of us know exactly like how to create it. And we all are taking guesses on how to make it better. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking transfer portal, you, you can't, you can't spend enough time with the guy to really know. And so uh, part of it, part of it, like I said, is, is luck. And a couple of people bring some donations to the table to say thank you to Dominic Robinson for being aboard here. Z Chan is one of them. Second donation tonight. Your content, Dominic, alone is worth subscribing to War Chan, he says. And then also Robert D. Echoing Dr. Chan. Thank you, D Rob. So Z Chan uh, and Robert, shout out. We appreciate you. Thank you very much, guys, for your Thanks comments. a lot, guys. Uh, I've got a question for you, D Rob, just because you see a lot of West Coast football. Um, I, I know you do. Um, 
you've been all over the country this year, I, I imagine, too, watching college football Saturdays. I know that you just got back home today from your travels. Given what you've seen from Florida State on the All-22, and then given what you've seen with your own eyes, and then maybe by extension if you looked at some other teams on the West Coast, the Pac-12 in its final year is, is making a lot of noise in terms of its relative strength, more than it has in a long time. How do you see Florida State stacking up compared to some of those teams out West? Because this Tuesday is the first college football playoff ranking where people are going to argue about relative strength. How does Florida State stack up in your mind to the elite in the country? So this is going to be interesting. I, I'm, I'm similar to what I think uh, um, we sacrificed basketball for this. I love that. <laughs> I was loving watching our basketball team. Bring them back. Bring those guys back. Pe- I love people people are convinced. Years. Yeah, people are convinced that had to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say it's going to be really interesting. And Ira, you touched on this. Um, they do need to be in the top four on this first go round. Not because of, you know, that it means, oh, how good they are or aren't. But I do think that the ACC championship being a weaker opponent, and it could be a very weak opponent if it ends up being like Virginia Tech, um, that's going to hurt. I Shout out to Virginia Tech, man. You guys are catching a bunch of strays for me. <laughs> I, I apologize, but you just got to get better. Yeah, it, it's just not uh, it's not great. I, I watched the film very closely. I wanted to not take shots. I'm not it's not personal. You're just not that good at football yet. And 34 are winning Thir- games. I hope 34 is not watching tonight. <laughs> 34. <laughs> I got a shot. I know I know there's a lot of Virginia Tech people that watch this <laughs> and get upset. I'm I'm sorry. They're just not very good. Um so that's gonna that's gonna hurt it, 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 as time goes on. You know, the, that that those some of those wins for us of the eight, nine, I guess when you get to the end, it'll be 11 wins or whatever are going to, you know, lose some of their their strength. And the Clemson win, for instance, you know, with that's losing strength as as every week goes on. So th- the team itself absolutely is can play in the top four the problem is if there ends up being five teams we're getting left out um that's that that's my that's my concern and so um but the the, you know the pac-12 is incredibly strong and the thing about the pac-12 that will help buoy them is you know for instance oregon and washington are both very good washington's now looking a little shaky you know, but if that's their, you know, um, you know, but then they beat Oregon and Oregon, I think is actually better than Washington. And I think in the end, that's how it's going to end up playing out is Oregon's going to win out and be better than Washington. Washington may have another loss. And, um, and so then what, or they, one or both of them need to get in. And then you always have to be weary of the, the second SEC team because they always end up in. Um, and then obviously, you know, Michigan and, and Ohio state are going to have something to say. So they can play this team, this Florida state team can absolutely play with all these PAC 12 teams that I've seen in person. Um, and, and, and have watched a lot of their, their all 22s also know the coaching staffs, know what they do schematically. Um, this team can play with them. The problem is going to be their schedules get tougher. As this thing ends, their games get bigger, where Florida State's games are sort of shrinking as the time goes on. That Florida, you know, Florida losing, you know, this week, that game just got smaller. It's big, it's as big as it can get for us, but from in terms of national perception, the Miami game, you know, that that game keeps shrinking as time goes on. Like I said, the ACC championship game, that game's going to shrink as time goes on. So I'm really concerned about that part. And then coming up on Tuesday or Wednesday, we're going to get together, record something for this week. I know that we're still, uh, you know, there's workshopping behind the scenes. Uh, you still think that red zone and Florida State's efficiency in the red zone might make an appearance this week? Or are you could, uh, going to be looking for another storyline as we get uh, on the channel this week? Yeah, I, 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 I 
previously uh, earlier this week, that was sort of my thought was I, I wanted to look at the red zone just because both Florida State offense is near the top 10 and the defense is in the top 10 in the country in, in red zone. So I yeah. thought it would be a, a compelling look to see what are they doing that's ha- allowing them to have such success on both sides of the ball um, and, and look at that. But I, I do want to, you know, um, you know, listen to listen to you guys and kind of see what you guys think. Um, you guys that are here, you know, watching watching the smash right now, you know, th- throw it in the comments, something that you want to see schematically, something that you're curious about, um, you know, or, or, you know, shoot us a message and, and uh, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's put it together. But I, I do at some point, either this week or next week, want to look at the red zone. And then when we play the rivals, I definitely want to kind of look at and take an overview and look at, um, look at them, maybe turn it, turn the lens away from us and look at, look at Florida see what they're doing look at Miami and and kind of do a do a little little breakdown on what they're doing and if I can see future success for them or if they're in trouble and they need need some help yeah Miami's in two short weeks and uh you know we'll we'll end it on this question here tonight uh as Iris have a technical difficulties you didn't run them off with your Pac-12 commentary or your fear <laughs> he disconnected <laughs> but just in terms of you know maybe not the atmosphere but the game itself between those two rivals Florida State is now undefeated through October. November has two in-state rival, I mean, Titan matchups uh, through the decades. What meant more to you on game day? Not necessarily in the lead up or the hype or the questions behind the scenes, but when you lined up on the field and you saw the orange and green or the orange and blue, which one hit you harder? Um, there, nothing meant more and still today than, than the UF, the, the Florida game. Um, you know, and I wonder sometimes now when I look back and just knowing and obviously being on the coaching side now, I want, I'm also wondering if that's because that game was always the last game and had some sort of bowl playoff implications or not play. We didn't have playoffs, but the bowl bowl implications and what, you know, I still remember my recruiting visit. Um, which was Tay Cody playing corner, had a sweet like one hand pick, you know, against Florida, you know, um, there at home in Doak. And um, and I just remember how big that game was because um that was uh that was actually Brock Berlin and and Rex Grossman, sexy Rexy, oh, were switching, wow. switching playing quarterback, and um Spurrier was still there. And I just remember coming into town and the buzzing, the, just the feel of the town and all of that. And with the, the Miami game, it's all it was always earlier. We usually, when I was there, we played them usually like week three or four. One year we played them Labor Day weekend, um, which was week one uh, or week zero that, back then. So, um, so that game, the, the Florida game, I think because it's been at the end of the season, just yep. – I, I have a I just have a huge I, I just can't stand them. I have I have a respect for Miami. Yep. Because they were so freaking good. Like you're you're an idiot if you don't have respect for the early 2000s Miami groups. Like that's on you. That's a personal thing with you. Um because they were so it was unbelievable how good they were. And a lot of those guys were my friends. Yep. Where Florida was a lot different, man. I had no respect. I never thought they were good. I just, I had, I never had respect for, for the Gators. And I always, I always had a respect for, for Miami where it was like, yeah, those guys are good. I always thought the Gators were trash. I always thought we were going to score 50 on them. Um, I never, you know, I never, Keon Ratliff or Kiwan Ratliff. Yep. I had, I had a slither of respect for him. And then we went down to the swamp and torch towards him. Um, that was the fourth and 14 that you just put up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I had a little bit of respect for him just cause he somehow always ended with the ball in his hands. Like he was a DB that had some ridiculous amount of fumble recoveries and interceptions, but I hated, I hated those, those, those guys. I had, I had very little respect for him. Yeah. Um, I'm, a little bit younger than you, not not a whole lot younger than you, and it was Florida for me too. I, I think if you grew up in the 80s or the 90s, like the hatred factor for Miami because 
of the wide rights and and those types of things that, right. that, that resonated for me it was it was always about Florida and with fourth and fourteen, I, you know, maybe if your opinion was different before that day started, maybe after it always became Florida because fourth and fourteens and the lore of the rivalry, you've got a moment which is just so cool. You grew up loving Florida State, like you said, but now you've got a moment in that rivalry's history when you see the montage before the game. It's like there you are. That's yeah, gotta be yeah. that's gotta be wild, man. That's gotta be a wild. Dude, field. I can't even put into words like how special that is and how great that is, especially now that I have kids. And, and I have players and athletes that, that work and train with me and I can tell them, Hey man, when you watch the Florida, Florida state game, you're, you're, you'll see me at some point in time, you're going to see that clip, you know, um, that's a cool, that's a, a really cool thing that it, you know, because again, I grew up watching those montages, <laughs> yep. you know, and watching Warwick Dunn, you know, up the sideline and the Derek Brook hit Derek Brooks hit and like watching all of those things. And then now um, a clip of me, will pop up, you know, for, for seven seconds, um, you know, during, during that, the, the, the lead up to that game. So yeah, definitely uh, an indescribable moment, you know, that, that I can, my athletes and my kids can, can get a, get to see old coach out there uh, with this, with this dreads as that was coach with hair that always trips them out. Cause that was back when I had hair. Um, the, they always get a trip out of, man, you had the long hair. So <laughs> There's um, I'll get to a couple of things in the chat and then we'll sign off for tonight. A couple of maybe things that we'll, we'll put on the feature this week, but to the, your point about respect with Miami um, 10 years ago, Florida state, Miami, it's a Saturday night game. College game day was here. I think they were here for it and it was, it was a top 10 matchup, but Miami wasn't even close. It was one of those, you know, soft top 10 rankings at any rate. Florida State wins going away, D-Rob, and Duke Johnson for the Canes goes down with a serious injury in the second half, and he has to be carted off the field, and, you know, he's got the towel over him, he's crying, and the cart goes back towards the Florida State tunnel, not, not the away tunnel because it's too narrow over there. And after the game, we're walking to the locker room, and we're walking to the press room for the interviews. Every single Florida State player stopped by the cart to talk to Duke because they're friends. They knew each mm -hmm. other. Everybody knows each other growing up. Uh, in that rivalry more so than the Florida and Florida State rivalry. And, I mean, to a man, every single player stopped by number 28 in white for Miami because of the respect factor that was there between those two programs. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a respect there. I think the other thing that shows up is every once in a while we'll have the little skirmish with the in the Miami game, but it's 100% of the time in the Florida game. Yeah. Like there's a reason for that. And that's because of our lack of respect, probably both ways. I mean, they probably feel the same way about us. Um, mm -hmm. But the Miami game, you, you'll get it you know, once every five years or so. Florida game, it's guaranteed. And it's probably going to be pregame. And there's probably going to be a postgame one. And there's probably going to be one in between the locker rooms later. Like it's it's every year. It's consistent. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's shown it, too, is like that goes back to that predates me. I remembered seeing that, the, you know, that skirmish, you know, between, you know, pregame between Florida, Florida State before I was, you know, in the 90s, in the late 90s. So, oh, man. I think they, that's an example of it. The most hated man in the Lang household in the 90s was none other than Steve Spurrier. And it wasn't mm -hmm. close. It wasn't close. And we come from Brooklyn. Yeah. Like, you know, we moved down there and learned about college football. We, we weren't <laughs> born in college football, but we learned to hate Steve Spurrier real fast in our house. Uh, yeah. A couple of points before we sign off. Uh, Briley says he'd love to see a breakdown of what we do that's exotic or confusing to quarterbacks. I know we don't do a lot defensively, but I'd love to see what we do when we mix it up. So that's one suggestion from Briley. And then John says, why haven't we run more running back screens? Once we started doing that, it opens up the rest of the field. Yesterday, there's a, a pass to Trey Benson that goes for 80 yards and a touchdown, uh, one of the plays of the game. Uh, but if either of those pique your interest, Dominic, we can certainly take a look at that uh, for this week's feature. Sounds good, man. I love it. Um, yeah, I think down the – down. The, I will say, down the road um, here, getting Trey and Toa Feely – some touches, you know, in the passing game is going to be vital, you know, going back to the initial breakdown on, on the Jordan Travis stuff is yep. if we're going to go drop back pass, you know, if you're getting to a game where you have to go drop back pass your fifth option in terms of your progression, you, that you have to use that. And that's where you end up getting the um, catastrophic, 
plays that end up hurting you is mm-hmm. when you neglect getting the ball to your backs in your passing game. Yep. And when you play very good defenses with good secondaries, with good guys up front that bring pressure, the way to alleviate that is, you know, Colorado did this early in the year. Every mo- Almost all of us watched that Colorado TCU game. Mm-hmm. It was a master class in – offensive coordinating and getting your quarterback settled down in a game. The, yep. the first that they, they completed, uh, I want to say 21 of 23 and not a single pass was past 10 yards. Mm-hmm. And then they started and I, I want to say Shador ended up throwing for like 400 yards in that game, but Dylan Edwards, who's like the, probably the fastest kid in college, college football is a freshman. Um, he and they end up winning on a play to Dylan Edwards, a pass play to Dylan Edwards. But um, the point I'm trying to make was, was in terms of being on time, a yep. lot of times that option is your back. So it's not necessarily screens like the question asks, but um, using those guys in the passing game is is really how you slow down the pressure because they get tired of, dang it, the ball's out. I get off on the ball. I get. I engage my defensive line or my offensive lineman. Oh, the ball's out. Oh, the ball's out. And he, the ball keeps coming out. And then you start to take advantage of guys that were, you know, tired defensive players. And now you can start pushing the ball down the field. And so um, that's something that you know we're going to have to do in order to win these these big games against tough defenses down the road. So, so yeah, I, I do. I will look into that and kind of look at the running back passing game and see if there's there's something there. If I'm not mistaken, in the first quarter, there's a flare thrown to Trey Benson on a third down that keeps it moving, and it's just so easy. And it's something that, you know, Tom Brady was a master class. He was that's, the- yeah, yeah. I was going to say, that's the thing. People, people, you watch a, a highlight of, of Peyton Manning or, or, um, or Tom Brady, and you're like, wow, these guys were so incredible. What you miss is there's like 20 completions in between that are just literally the most boring thing you'd ever see. James White, James <laughs> White, James White. I mean, <laughs> it's it's unbelievable, man. And that's that. Uh, I'll be honest with you. You know, getting to watch Caleb every every week, um, that's what's missing in his game, and that's probably why he's not going to win win the Heisman. Yeah. Is you ha- every play cannot be the touchdown play. Those guys have scholarships too. Those coaches get paid close to a million dollars to stop you. They're not going to just let you do what you do well all the time. They're going, they work on it all week, just like you've been working all week. You have to, but, but the thing, the nature of defense is we have to give something up. Yep. There has to be something that we, we can't take everything away. And then eventually once we, once if offense, if you just take it, take it, take it, Human nature takes over. You're a defender that wants to kill these guys. You get overly aggressive on something and you go do what you weren't coached to do. And then you end up getting beat. And so that's the thing. That's where Jordan Travis is going to have to grow. And, um, and that's sort of the evolution of the offense, what's needed in order to win these big games where you don't have the one-on-one advantage, where you can't just throw up a 50-50 ball and know that your guy's going to win it you know, 50% of the time. And that's what's coming up is the defining moments of the season. It starts Tuesday night with the college football playoff show. We'll have a watch along here on War Chant TV. Join us a little bit before 7 o'clock as we will react to where Florida State sits through the first week of the college football playoff rankings that's coming up on the channel. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. It's absolutely free. Do so. Uh, and you hit the bell. It'll alert you when we go live. So if you forget, your phone will let you know we are live. He's Dominic Robinson, the lead analyst here, the lead football analyst on warchant.com, warchant TV. We will be doing a feature this week. We look forward to seeing you at that uh, point in time for Ira Chauffel, whose computer went uh, kaput in the last 20 minutes for director Ben behind the scenes. We want to thank every one of you who uh, participated in the chat, whether it was with contributions like Robert or Joshua or Z Chan, a different Robert, Tommy Jenkins, Jeffrey Johnson, Noel Buck. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. But then also if you're driving the conversation, that is extremely valuable to us. So thank you for doing so and for being part of this broadcast. For Dominic, I'm Tom. This has been Sunday Smash presented by State Farm agent and longtime Florida State War Chant supporter Russ Forhisk.